I want to explain this shirt real quick that I'm wearing so that you're not wondering what in the world does it mean, the entire sermon. It means, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. Might be hard to see from up there, but this is a shirt that means a lot to me because God is doing amazing things. And even during the difficult times in my life or in the good, God still deserves all the glory. And he will get glory even in my trials, even in my difficulty. I still choose to point to God as a good God, no matter what happens in 2020. And so to God be the glory this year. And I want to uh, share something that was on my heart during worship real quick. I just need to get this off my chest. Um, God, uh, I felt like God was whispering to me that I am worthy of your songs, but I'm also worthy of your daily obedience. Amen. As we were singing worthy, I am worthy of these songs, but I'm also worthy of your daily obedience. So in other words, we don't just sing these songs and say he's worthy, but we live our lives in such a way that says he is worthy. Amen, church? Amen. So he's called us to live out a life that glorifies him, a life that obeys him, and it actually goes really well with our message today. And we're talking about first things first this month. Pastor Kuhn will be here next week to preach to us. He hasn't preached since the beginning of September. So that's really cool. Yeah. It was funny. I told him my heart about first things first, and, and, or he was telling me his heart about first things first. And I was like, that's the title of my series this month. So, okay, I guess we're on the right track together. And we literally did not talk about that. So he's going to, basically what we're focusing on here in, and what he's going to focus on is what really matters in the beginning of the year. What's the first thing that we should focus on? And uh, so that's what we're covering. And, uh, you know, a new year, 2020, is a new year of opportunity, some fresh starts, right? That's what we usually use it for. And uh, I, 2020, just, it's inevitable, it's cliche, but it's, it's 2020 vision, right? clear picture of what God wants to do, you know, looking at life through the lens of God and what he wants, how he wants us to see life. And so today, I really want us to grasp that. How does God want us to see this year? And I was down at the beach, and I was getting away for the day on December 31st to just get with God and thank him for 2019 and to seek his face about 2020. And uh, I got to say, I was hoping that God would, like, encourage me with, like, and don't get me wrong, this is encouraging, but I was hoping that you know, God would like, just pour out all this encouragement of like, you're going to do this and this and this and this. And instead, God was like hitting me with questions for me. I was just reflecting on questions I felt like he was hitting me with because I, what I was feeling burdened was is that I was going down there to figure out all the things that I was going to do and what I was going to focus on. And God was like, but what about what I want you to focus on? What, what about what I want you to focus on? What is my focus for your life, Ryan? And I think it's really important to understand that, you know, Paul and Peter and John and the Old Testament prophets and all those people that serve God, they didn't go to God and say, hey, God, this is my plan. Can you bless it, please? They didn't do that. Do you know what we see in Scripture? We see that people surrendered their lives to God's plan. In other words, they stepped into whatever God was already doing. God has a will and plan for your life and my life. And our job isn't to tell God what he should do for us. Our job is to tell God what we'll do for him. What we'll do for him to serve him. Now, the, the byproduct of that is if we serve God, we're going to have an awesome life. There's going to be some amazing things that happen. Sometimes there's trials too, but God uses them, as we'll hear a little bit later on as well. So let me share a few things that I was being hit by as I was hanging out with God. And, and I don't mean to be antagonistic. I don't mean to be negative about New Year's resolutions or goals or your focuses. I don't mean to do that. I think it's important for personal growth. But as believers, we have to understand something. That our lives are woven together with other relationships besides just ourselves. We're not living on an isolated island. Our lives, our focus has to consider our relationship with God. Our focus has to consider another one, too, our relationship with each other. We can't just focus on ourselves in 2020. We have to focus on the inevitable relationships that we have with God and with each other, with our family, our kids. And what's going to happen is 
our focuses are going to affect those relationships. So the first thing that God put on my heart as I was journaling and reading the Bible is he just wanted me to do something really simple that we all know, and that's to put him first. So put God first and keep him first. And really what I want to talk about here is putting God's will first. What is God's will for my life? Because God has plans and purposes for us. But what's interesting is, is a lot of our goals can revolve around our own plans and wills. And here's the thing I was hit to. I was, I was thinking about this question. Are we familiar with the plans and desires that God has for us? Or have we been so busy writing our own? And we're not even aware what God wants us to do or who he wants us to be. And I truly believe that we need to return back to our creator and the purpose for what he has created us for. And by the way, God's will is already in motion. We're stepping into his will for our lives. And unfortunately, too often, we're making plans and then asking God to bless them instead of seeking the blessed path that God has already blessed. The blessed path that he already has for us. Think about that for a moment. That God has already blessed a journey for me this 2020. And my focus isn't to write my 2020. My focus is to find out what that is. My focus is to find out what is God's will for my life, not what Ryan's will is. And I hope that God will make it happen. What has God already ordained for me to do this year? And one of the best things that I can do to live in God's will is to offer my life to serve God, to offer my year to him. Romans 12, 1 through 2 says this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you, to give your whole life to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Mm -hmm. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You know what was happening to me on December 31st at a coffee shop by myself? God was like, I don't want you to think the way the world thinks on your new year of 2020. I want you to think the way I think. I want you to be conformed to my will, my plans for your life. So put the brakes on it, Ryan, and start thinking about what I have planned in store for you and for the relationships because my plans for you are going to affect the people around you. Now, if we don't believe this, we have to understand something. I could not be here right now today if I decided to sleep in. So my plans do affect other people, and so do yours as well. Your boss might not be happy tomorrow morning, just in case you don't show up. And Jesus is our greatest example, isn't he? In John 5.30, it says this, I can't do anything by myself. Whatever I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. And I love this line, I don't seek my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. He's talking about God. So Jesus is even seeking out God's will for his life. And Jesus' attitude was your will done on earth as it is in heaven. And whatever God's will is, was the will, was the life that Christ would live. So bottom line, this year, God's will takes precedence or priority over our own. So let's put the brakes a little bit. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm not trying to say don't focus on you. You'll hear at the end how that matters. But should we seek out what God wants first, even if it means using the first month or the entire year to figure out what God's will is? Because here's here's what I want you to think about. What if we spent a year seeking God's desires for us? I bet you at the end of the year, we would be a whole lot better than what we could write. If I spent a whole year reading the Bible and praying and getting involved in community groups so other people could teach me and help me and and come here to church, imagine coming to church 52 times this year. Every single time I come, I'm going to get something for my life that God's going to use for his glory. What if God's will is for me to be here for other times? What if God's will is for me to help other people follow Jesus? There's so many more things besides my own spiritual growth, and God has a plan for me to grow in those, though. 
What if we found out by the end of the year that my seeking God, I end up having a better year filled with purpose and I'm actually living in God's will by the time I walk into 2021? If the Lord should tarry, right? If he doesn't come back first. Because we don't know that either, do we? God's will is always better than mine. Let's just be real. So I'd rather see what the Bible says his will is and jump in it. So this year I want to encourage you to discover God's will by getting alone with him. And pastor's going to talk about that more next week. So I'm giving us three things to think about today to help launch us into the First Things First series. And I want to say this real, real quick. I feel like I'm called to be a discipleship pastor. And a disciple is a student of God's word, a student of Jesus Christ, a follower of Christ. And as I learn from Jesus, we're called to help make disciples. And so my job is to actually teach you what I learned too. And so in my sermon today, it's as if we're sitting down at that coffee shop together and we're learning together through scripture how we're supposed to live and how we're supposed to think. So if you haven't caught it yet, I'm just, I'm discipling today the entire church together as if we're having coffee together. And the first thing I want you to understand is that God's will really does take precedence over our own. Amen. And it's better that we seek out this year what his will is for our life by getting alone with him and reading the word, which revealed 90% of his will anyway, yes. at least what we can understand, or more, not more than 90%, his will is already in scripture. Sorry. And by the way, one of his biggest wills for your life is to actually be in relationship with him. Right. And when you are in relationship with him, you'll find out you're living in his will. That's deep, but it's true, because that's what I've discovered in my own life. And the second thing is, because we're in relationship with God, the other thing is, we're in relationship with others. So this year, we need to think of others. Think of others. Romans 12, 4 through 5, is a scripture that we cannot escape. If you're a believer of Jesus Christ, you cannot escape something. You belong to the body of Christ, which means your life is woven together with my life. Are you cool with that? <laughs> Are we all right with that? Yep. But it's kind of neat because here I am and you're listening to me and I'm speaking and then when I get with you, I get to hear your heart and so we have this relationship together. We're the body of Christ. And Romans 12, four through five says, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. And so it's important that we come together on Sundays and come together for coffee or whatever, for discipleship moments, groups, because the next verse is so important. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. He's saying this, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good deeds and good works. So my list could have been a bunch of stuff that I'm going to do for myself, but then God's like, no, I want you to think of ways to bless other people. So put a break, Ryan, on your personal plans, and I want you to think about how you're going to bless and encourage other people to spur them on to good deeds and loving God. Wow. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now the day of his return is drawing near. And then there's a typo in here, but Philippians 2.4, not 4.4, that's my bad. It says, don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. So here I am, I'm, I'm drinking coffee, I'm writing down things, and God's hit me saying, our lives are woven together, and so will the impact of our decisions. So will the impact or the influence of our decisions this year. And so we can't live for ourselves. We are the body of Christ, and we have to consider the needs of others, not just our own. But what's beautiful about this is, is that God has chosen to use you and I to change the destinies of other people's lives. Let me say that again. Because you may not feel like you're worthy of being used by God, but the reality is that God uses you and I to help change the destinies of other people's lives. God is going to use you to help someone know Christ this year, Lord willing, right? That's what we're praying for. That's one of our agendas that we need to alter or change. One of our goals we need to consider is, God, 
you want to use me to reach the lost. And I can help change someone's destiny from eternity in hell to eternity in heaven this year. The fact that God blesses us so that we can bless others. But there's one more important thing. God doesn't waste our suffering either. God doesn't waste the trials that we've been through. God uses them so that you can help other people that go through the same thing. In fact, your struggles or your mistakes or the the losses in your family or the battle with things in your life are meant also to be used to help other people. In other words, God wants to use those things as well so that you can help someone else going through the same thing. And the reality is, is uh, we can't really be a blessing or help someone go through those suffering times or those trials or difficulties unless we get together. And and the thing is, is like a lot of our goals can sometimes be focused on what we're going to do in our isolated alone time. And and God didn't wire us to do that. I know some of us feel that way, but God has wired us. God has redeemed us. God has saved us to walk into a relationship with Christ that involves all of us together. And so as I'm writing these things down, I'm writing down some goals for my life and my focus. God's like, don't forget that your life is woven together with your church and the body of Christ. So you must think of others. And lastly, I felt a burden to make sure we know that this year, 2020, that we do everything for the glory of God. It it inspired my shirt. I think it's cool. Maybe you think it's cheesy. I like it. It's an acronym that's going to create conversation. It already worked twice in the past two days that I've had it. And uh, the screen printer and I were talking about it. And then today I was talking to someone about it as well. Actually, a few people today. Gives me a chance to talk about what does it mean to give God all the glory. What does glory mean? We say do everything for the glory of God. What does glory mean? It's a good question, right? Glory is the majestic nature, the goodness, the character of God. It's the faithfulness of God. It's his love and his forgiveness. It's his peace. It's his joy. It's the glory of God. It's the only way you can explain it. The church would use this word. The Bible would use this word. The people of God would use this word to wrap up all of the amazing things about God into one word, his glory. What we're looking for in life is his glory. And his glory came, de- came down here on earth through his son, Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And that's why so many people fell in love with Jesus, because he was the visible image of the invisible God. Look at these scriptures here. Colossians 1. It says this. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. And he goes on to say this. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. Wow, isn't that crazy? That God was contained in Christ. That is powerful to think about. And then lastly, the Son, or Jesus, radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. You know what I'm saying here? You know what the Bible's saying here? Is that when Jesus came down to earth, we got 20-20 vision of God. The glory of God was seen in Jesus' life. Amen. That's powerful. Amen. Jesus drew crowds. Jesus was attractive in how he handled himself and how he showed love. Not everyone liked Jesus. They crucified him, right? But there was something about Jesus. There's something about the name of Jesus and what Jesus represents. And God was like, that's me In Christ, I'm here. And why is that a big deal? It's a big deal for us because God wants to use us as well to bring glory to him, to help people see his majestic nature, his his majesty, his love, his good deeds. But look real quick at what Jesus said. I mean, Jesus is literally praying, and this is what he says in John 17. This is how much Jesus cared about this. And so we should too. He says, Father, the hour has come. He's getting ready to be crucified. He's praying. It says, glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. Mm -hmm. 
Now hold on a second, because this is Jesus knowing he's going to go to the cross, knowing he's going to suffer, and somehow that's going to bring glory to God. That's a lot to stomach and understand when we personally go through trials, isn't it? To pause for a moment and to think that if Jesus was saying if, if he suffers that it, it will bring attention to God, how does that all work out? Well, right away it looked really bad. Right away it looked like his suffering was bad. But then three days later, three days later, all of a sudden the glory piece made sense, didn't it? And once the grave was opened up, all of a sudden, there was a ton of glory, and then we have a revival happening in Jerusalem and, and throughout the world, and now we are uh, uh, affected by that. We have been changed because of the revival that took place at Jesus' resurrection. What I'm saying is, is don't count out your suffering this year. God can use it to bring attention to his faithfulness and his goodness even when you suffer. The fact that you would still have joy in your trials makes people go, well, how do you do that? Where do you find that strength? And so now you get a chance to share with them, to God be the glory. Philippians 1.11, Paul literally prays for his church to glorify God. He says this, may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, which is the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. In other words, you wouldn't even have the glory of God if you didn't have Jesus. Because you have Jesus, though, you have the fruit of Jesus Christ in you, and through your life, people are able to see Jesus and see God. It says this, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. I think about that, and I was like, is that my prayer this year? That I, look, that I am filled with more of Jesus so that people will see me or so that people will see Jesus, see God. I've seen me. I'm not going to help that many people, you know, just by my own power and ability. I hope that people see God in me, and that's the goal. But I've seen me. I've seen my life. I'm not going to get anyone to heaven, but the God who lives in me can. Amen. Amen. So yes, I want Jesus to grow in my life this year. I want to be more like Christ because that means people will come to know Christ and they won't have to go to hell if they see Jesus in my life and ask and I can share the love of Christ with them and they believe in him. I mean, John 15, four through five verse, and verse eight says this, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot, be fr or you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. And when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Sam was alluding to it earlier as he was praying. The very... A glory that we're trying to show cannot happen unless we have a fellowship and relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And in that fellowship, he grows the character of Christ in us. And the result is amazing. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine. Let the glory, in other words, of Jesus Christ shine in your life before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Whenever you read that in Scripture, what he's trying to say is, is that people should see your good deeds and then be open to Christ and believe in Jesus Christ, and now they will worship with their life. They will glorify God. The result of someone seeing Jesus in you, we pray as we lead them to Christ and pray with them and all that, is that they will now live their life to glorify God. Wow. So, yeah, that has something to do with me, but it has a lot to do with God and others, doesn't it? You see where I'm headed here? 
is that our, our 2020 isn't just for ourself. It's, it's God's will. It's the life of others. But ultimately, my life is supposed to point to God. My life should point to God because other people need God. It's that simple. So it was like God was hitting me in the face this past Tuesday, and he was like, is making me, is glorifying me on your priority list this year? Because if we're going to have 2020 vision and see life the way God does, we have to look at his word, and it was all, that was, that was Jesus' end game, was that God is seen in his life. That was the apostles' end game, is that, is that God would be seen in their lives. And so that's the same for us. I love what the Apostle Paul wraps up in Colossians 3.17. He wraps this all up into one amazing verse. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So whatever you say or do, do it for the glory of the Lord in other translations. What's interesting is, is if you go back to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, we were made in the image of God. In other words, we're bearers of God's image in our lives. We are supposed to actually represent and reflect God. Now, sin damaged that and has hindered that, but through Jesus Christ, we now become representatives again of his image and what he meant. Your life really is supposed to glorify God. So therefore, it really does matter. Your personal goals does matter. Your personal growth this year matters. Your personal decision, your per personal focus matters. Especially in the will of God. So I'm not saying don't focus on personal growth. I'm not saying tackle some things. I'm saying actually crush your goals, but do it for the glory of God. Do it so that people will see God. Amen. We can't do it without God, as we heard before. So the proper perspective isn't to ignore yourself. The proper perspective is to be who God wants you to be. The proper perspective is, is to be the way God has created you to be. The proper perspective is, is is to be who all he wants you to be, not what you want to be. Mm -hmm. Think about this for a second. If I focus on how I want to be, I'm actually aiming really low because God can do so much more than I can. Mm -hmm. Let's not aim low. Let's aim towards whatever God wants and see what he does this year in our lives and in our church because we can't help it, but... Our lives are woven together right here in this building and in other churches and in your community. Those who are not saved, they're going to witness the glory of God in your life this year by the power and the grace of Jesus Christ. I hope that you don't carry burdens, but you carry the glory of God this year. But if you were to carry one burden, it would be for the lost this year. Like you shouldn't bring anything that was terrible in your life, even though it probably helped shape and mold you to be closer to God, don't count it out. But you don't need to carry any shame, any guilt, or anything like that into this new year. Right. You can carry the glory of the Lord instead. Right. Amen. And God will use you. But for what purpose? So that people can see you or so that people can see the way to, li to life, to eternal life. In Jesus Christ. So I, I challenge us as a church to put God first, to keep him first, to think about others this year, and the good and the bad, give God glory for it all, because we couldn't be here without him, and we couldn't do this without his help. Let's pray. Why don't we stand together and we'll pray.
God, I thank you for your word today and how it gives us a proper perspective on this life. And there's so many more things that could be taught. There's so many more things that we can learn today, but these are the three things we learn. God, I pray that we would see this year through your lens, through your eyes. I thank you, God, for corrective lenses to help us see the way you want us to see it. And God, I thank you that you would choose me and us, that we would be even worthy of carrying your glory. And that through our lives, people are going to step from darkness into light. Through our lives, people are going to come to know Christ. It's going to be an amazing year when we give it all to you. We love you, God. We thank you for what you did in 2019. And Lord, we look forward to what you're going to do in 2020. And we hold on to the handlebars of your will. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a ride. But God, we know that if we're in your will, we're in the best place we can be. We give you all the glory and praise. To you, God, be all the glory for everything that's done this year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a great day.